Once in a blue moon, a game will come out of nowhere and shock you. You start playing it without much expectation or anticipation, but by the time that you're done with it, you're left in awe of what was accomplished. You search and search for reasons, an explanation of why this experience was so engrossing. Maybe it's going to take everybody by surprise, or maybe it'll be ignored by the larger gaming media, or maybe, just maybe, it really is that good, and all of your feelings are justified. This feeling of unjustified and inexplicable quality is one that is hard to ignore, and it's a feeling that's all over The Surge 2. Without a doubt, it is one of the most surprisingly good games I've played in a long time. The sci-fi action RPG is expansive, polished, and engrossing every step of the way. It follows in the footsteps of the original Surge and other titles that it's constantly compared to, namely Dark Souls and Bloodborne. The Dark Souls comparison is so troglodytic at this point that this will be the final mention of it in this video. I'm going to evaluate this game on its merits, not on whether or not it satiates my From Software fetish. Yes, I'm throwing shade at the big reviewers who will no doubt rant endlessly about the comparison. You are so brave. You are so brave. Regardless, what I can say is that this game scratches that itch better than any game released in the last two years, and it places the developer, Deck 13, in the same field of developers as far as I'm concerned. Now don't worry, I'm going to be explaining all of this in detail in the coming minutes. But I also want to let you know that I will be showing later in the video footage and discussing the first boss in the game to demonstrate a few points about the combat system. I will let you know when this is about to happen, and I will include a timestamp of where to skip to if you don't want to know about it. Just a heads up. But I don't think it'll ruin the boss fight for you, it'll just demonstrate the basics of the combat system in action. Nonetheless, I will be going into why this game is so good in this video, and I want to thank Focus Home Interactive for sending over the review code over a week before the game's launch. That's pretty rare, and I think it deserves praise. There are still a couple of issues in the game which we're going to discuss, but it is no doubt worth your time. Now to begin. At the start of the game, you're greeted with a character creation section. This is always a fun little thing, but it's important to note that it really doesn't matter matter what your character looks like, as you're going to be covered up with armor within the first 30 minutes of gameplay. But still, it's a fun touch, but I would say it's not necessary at all. Beards and hair of any kind look, frankly, terrible, but it's okay because once again, you're not going to see them for 99.9% .9 of the game. After you're done with this, you explore a hospital tutorial area, and shortly after this, you find an exosuit and allocate three basic stats, health, stamina, and battery efficiency. Health, as you would guess, increases your total pool of HP, stamina, your usable energy, and battery efficiency basically changes the rate at which you build your battery charges in addition to increasing the total effectiveness of injectables that use battery charges, such as healing and damage buffs. In other words, making them more efficient. As you level up, you gain more and more points to put into each of these three categories. And, as you would expect, you can allocate them however you want. Whether you're playing as a tank or somebody who's quick and uses a lot of stamina but has low health, you can do whatever you want. Furthermore, you can reassign these points at any time for a very small charge of scrap, making it very easy to change your build if you're having trouble with one boss's specific specialties. If they hit like a truck and keep one-shotting you, you can grind for some upgrades or you can just reallocate your already collected points to wait into your health more. But this isn't where the Surge 2's customization stops. With a plethora of weapons and armor sets, the player can approach any situation in almost any style that they want, even changing their loadouts on the fly entirely so that you can take on different enemies in the most efficient way possible. But we'll discuss all of this more in just a moment. The sound design is stellar, and graphically the game is nothing to scoff at, especially once you get into some of the later game areas. The soundtrack felt a bit odd at times, but for the most part fits with the theme and works. It's like they say, if you didn't notice it, it probably was doing its job. Performance is pretty clean across the board, with only a couple of areas later in the game consistently causing frame dips, although Deck 13 has said that these should be vastly improved on launch day. I played on the Xbox One X, so I can't speak to the level of customization or performance on PC, for instance, but on the Xbox, the game runs very, very well, and I didn't encounter any notable glitches or problems. Now, there is a story in the game, and it's actually pretty interesting, but the developers know that that's not why people are playing, and so 
they tend to keep most of the exposition relegated to sound recordings and world-based storytelling. Which is fine, because as I said, the star is the combat. Now to begin, the original Surge's combat focused on targeting body parts with attacks and learning how to correctly deflect attacks from opponents, and it worked fairly well. In The Surge 2, this is taken to another level. All of the animations, response times, and hitboxes are vastly improved over the last game. But the key to The Surge 2's combat is a directional parry system which requires the player to not just block at the right time, but also to indicate the direction from which the attack is coming. Whether it's a swing from the left, right, overhead, or a scooping sweep attack. Say that 10 times fast. Scooping sweep, scooping sweep. I can't do it. Furthermore, enemies can have different tolerances for these parries. So for some enemies, one parry will stagger them, allowing you to deal damage, whereas others require two or three consecutive parries to be staggered at all. This keeps the mechanic engaging, as it doesn't become obsolete as a gameplay mechanism as the player gets better at it the more that they play. You also have a drone on your back, which you can swap out with different abilities to help you in different situations. Whether it's an EMP blast or a sniper rifle strapped to your back, it can come in handy more than you'd think, especially in late game boss fights who have some weaknesses to certain drones. But using all of this, the highlight of the combat and the game in general is the bosses, because they are the ones that frame this combat system the best. Each of these bosses encourage different strategies meant to train the player in a new approach. This means that the first few times you go against a boss, you'll suck and blow it repeatedly. <laughs> Oh my, I just read that out loud for the first time. That's not right. Okay. Uh, uh, wow. I meant that like you'll suck at the fight and you'll blow the fight. Like you're going to do badly. But instead I typed out that you're going to suck and blow the boss repeatedly. Oh, geez. That's bad. Okay. Moving on. The point is it won't make sense and it will seem needlessly difficult. But once you sit back, think of the best way to deal with the bugger, you'll find yourself taking them on in very tactical ways. Some are weak to poison, others to nanite damage, and others to fire, but each are different and require unique approaches. Now the Surge 2's tactical customization comes in the form of different weapon and armor effects. One suit will offer individual component bonuses in the form of buffs against certain elemental damage or buffs in favor of outputted elemental damage. And they'll also offer set bonuses, encouraging the player to search for schematics for every suit style that they like. Then you can collect these schematics by engaging with enemies and targeting specific body parts, such as the arms, legs, torso, or head. Successfully breaking each of these will allow you to collect the schematic for that body part matching the type of armor worn by said enemy. This means that if you want a high level enemy's armor set, you'll need to take them on once for the arms, once for the the legs, once for the torso, and once for the head schematics. Furthermore, this also works for collecting weapons. See an enemy with a cool sword? Just target the arm that's holding it and there's a chance that they'll drop the weapon and or the arm schematic as well. But it's important to know that you won't always deal damage to that body part that you're targeting. Sometimes you'll deal it to the legs when you're aiming for the head or vice versa. This means that you have to actually think of the attack that you're doing and whether or not it will hit the target area, whether you're using one of the the game's two main attacks, vertical or horizontal. However, this can be helped with the use of certain implants which act as specific skills and abilities that you can load out with. For instance, some implants will change the amount of damage that you deal, others will increase your defense, and one will indicate the direction of the attack that's incoming, making it far easier to parry, which I consider this implant to be a must for all players at all times, if you're not a self-flagellating Manichaean glutton for pain. And another implant is called the Physical Aggression Redirector, and this implant costs three power consumption, which is a stat that increases every time that you level up using scrap that you collect in the world, and on its lowest level, it ensures that all damage applies to the targeted body part, and if damage hits another body part as a result of a poorly targeted swing, its efficacy is decreased by 75%. And you'll see why I brought this implant up specifically in just a moment. All of these things have their 
own special uses and can be upgraded throughout. For instance, I found a set of armor that I really liked and so I just made sure to continue upgrading it as I went through the game. I would also discover new armor sets that I liked as I explored the world and I'd craft those out too, though it is important to say that often these started out at much lower levels and strengths than the armor I was already using. So if I wanted to change to a new suit, I needed to spend a lot of scrap and materials to upgrade it to the point where it made sense to use it. And to be honest, on multiple occasions, it discouraged me from experimenting with new armor sets because the cost of upgrading was so high. Now, higher level gear in the late game does help with this, but it was an issue that I came across a few times. But let's look at all of this in action in the very first boss fight. As I said, this is your spoiler warning if you don't want to see the first boss. A timestamp will appear on screen right about now, so if you don't want to see any of these details or the boss fight at all, skip ahead to that time. But with that said, this guy is named Little Johnny, quite ironically, and you fight him in Port Nixon in the first few hours of the game. There is a tutorial boss before this that's about 10 minutes into the game, but honestly, I wouldn't count him as an actual boss. Now, Little Johnny is inside of a giant robot crab body, and you fight him in a very large arena. He has a pretty varied set of different attacks, and those attacks will become more frantic as the fight goes on. Now, the game doesn't tell you how to take him down, so you have to start experimenting and this is something that's very intentional on the part of the developers. Effectively, they're trying to show players that the best way to take down these massive, confusing, and baffling enemies is to just start experimenting, to not be afraid of dying, and to keep trying. And so, you start experimenting. Once locking on and trying to target specific body parts, you'll see that you can target each one of his legs and two small tanks underneath the main body of the machine. Attacking these points will eventually break them, showing a container breaking underneath what initially appeared to be his health bar. But it turns out that this actually represents a coolant system for the machine. And as you break each one of the weak points, you'll increase the overall temperature of the crab thing. There's no specified order in which you're supposed to do this. The developers actually recommend taking on the tanks underneath the main body first, likely because these do the most damage, I guess you could say, to him. The thing is, enemies in the Surge 2 will change how they fight based on the damage that you've dealt unto them. If you target the tanks first instead of the legs, Little Johnny becomes highly erratic and protects his legs, which makes sense, and he flails them around the arena, making the last three weak points very difficult to hit, even once you unlock the camera. And so, at this point, I decided to take the legs down first and focus on the body last. I also equipped that implant I referred to earlier that dealt all the damage to the targeted body part. Out in the world, this implant wasn't very useful, as it tended to make defeating enemies take longer, but for this boss, with specific weak points, it was the hidden key, at least for my playstyle. Once I did all of this and took out his legs, he became much less mobile and I was able to finish his body tanks off without much trouble, as he just cycled through a few basic attacks since his legs were broken. And this is what The Surge 2 does so well. It poses a problem to the player and gives them the tools to deal with it, but it's up to the player to creatively overcome the challenges in whatever way they see fit. Enemy variety is high, at least in terms of weapon and armor loadouts, and I rarely felt as though I was running through a copy and pasted area. Furthermore, the bosses are also highly varied with only a few recycling some of the same ideas. The only big problem with the combat is that taking on multiple enemies is still terrible. You can unlock the camera, but usually once you deal damage to an enemy, the camera will lock onto them and focus on that body part that you hit. I didn't notice this on bosses, but I did notice it on smaller enemies out in the world. This means that you're constantly fighting with the lock-on system when you're surrounded by more than one enemy. And I get it, it's trying to be helpful, but I wish it would just leave the lock-on to the player. Who knows though, maybe this will be patched out by launch, I'm not sure. All I know is that it caused a few frustrating deaths. One of the other ways that the game encourages exploration and experimentation is in the world itself. The level design is so intricate, it's honestly hard to explain or to quantify. The amount of detail, interwoven paths, and secret hidden passages is frankly astounding, and it makes exploring every level a joy. From minute to minute, you never know how one path is going to 
to circle back and reconnect to the main hub. By the time you take down a level's boss, you'll be so familiar with all of the secret passageways in the level that you'll feel as though you've conquered not just the boss, but the very area itself. But my one issue with level design like this is that it can often leave the player unsure of where they're supposed to go next. The game is littered with maps and directional hints, and they do explain to you where you're supposed to go generally, but there were still a few times where I wasn't sure where I was supposed to be going. In spite of this, all of the areas are vastly different from each other, which is surprising considering they're all in roughly the same area, just outside the complex that the first game ends within. Seriously, the level design in this game is off the charts, and whoever is responsible deserves a serious raise. But in conclusion, there is a lot in this game, and honestly, I'm having trouble keeping this relatively non-specific to ensure that all of you who try the game discover these secrets on your own. I enjoyed the game so much, I just want to talk about it, so maybe I'll make a full-size critique of the game. I don't know, let me know if you'd like to see that down in the comment section below. In conclusion, The Surge 2 took me by total surprise. I expected something fairly average, and honestly, bland. But instead, I got an action RPG that goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the best that we've seen in years. It's incredibly impressive, and I can't applaud Deck 13 enough. If you're a fan of action RPGs with robust boss fights, intricate level design, and a vast array of equipment to craft, customize, and upgrade, then The Surge 2 is a must-buy.